Hi, this is Dr. Darwin, the new dentist coach, with another episode of Ask Dr. Darwin on the new dentist coach show. Uh, be sure to subscribe and leave comments after you watch this video. We love, I love all the comments that, you, that we've been getting over the last couple of weeks on, on this new podcast series, also on this series on careers and dentistry. So if you have topics or parts of dentistry that you want to learn more about, feel free to shoot me an email right here at newdentistcoach at gmail.com, newdentistcoach at gmail.com. Also, when you subscribe, be sure that you turn on your notifications so that you don't miss out on all the episodes that are released and published on Mondays and on Thursdays, okay? So today, today we're going to learn how to become a periodontist, a periodontist. We're here joined live with uh, Dr. Bill Riles. And uh, Dr. Riles, Brother Riles, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Thank you, darling. First, let me just say that this, I think what you're doing is awesome, man, it's in terms of mentoring young dentists and just giving back. I think, it, I think it's great. Yeah, man, it's it's so important. I've, I've also, uh, when I was a young dentist, or younger dentist, I should say, I, I've had some great mentors along the way. So, yeah, each one teach one. You know how that goes. I know how that goes, team. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Doc, tell us a little bit more about, about yourself. Okay. I've been a uh, practicing dentist for 33 years now. Graduated from uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. Yeah, 33, I can't believe it. Back in uh, 1985. And uh, went from there and did a general practice at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in Patterson, New Jersey. And uh, from there, I went on to uh, Fairleigh Dickinson for their uh, periodontal residency program. And so uh, moved to the Washington, D.C. area where I uh, maintained a private practice limited to perio and implant for about 25 years. And after 25 years, uh, transitioned into another area, uh, and that has been uh, academics and residency training, which I'm doing now and uh, enjoy it immensely. Wow, that's great. That's great. Um, so you're, you're in Alabama now, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, so Alabama. I think, I've, I think I've driven by the Alabama. That's right, Birmingham. <laughs> so, explain a little bit your position that that you currently have, and how it kind of how you kind of evolved into that that position uh, over the years. Okay. Uh, uh, great question. I currently am the uh, AEG, AEGD director here at the Birmingham VA. I have a uh, four resident program. Uh, we're a 12 month uh, training program. And what I do, I guess probably 30% uh, of my time is spent in patient care. Uh, and then probably 50% uh, of my time is spent uh, in resident training. And then uh, the rest of the time, 20% is, uh, is, is administration. And so after having spent almost uh, 25 years in clinical practice, I still view myself as a clinician. And so I would not uh, want a position that, uh, where I was just strictly administrative. So I spend some time treating patients. The rest of the time I spend uh, training our residents. And I also, uh, our hospital has uh, an affiliation with a dental school, University of Alabama, Birmingham. And so all of their graduate residents, perio, endo, oral surgery, rotate through our hospital. So I spent a day uh, interfacing and mentoring uh, the graduate perio residents in addition to our AEGD residents. I got you. Now, how I actually got into, how I actually got into this uh this particular discipline and this time in my life is really a culmination of what I experienced in the 25 years that I was in private practice. And basically, Darwin, what I came to see uh, and what I thought the future of dentistry was, was that of comprehensive general dentists practicing and performing uh, the full spectrum of dentistry. Mm. And so 
with that as a periodontist, I wanted to get involved with training dentists to be able to do that because truly that's what I preach. That's what I teach. That's where I think the future is. Wow. So training GPs and, and dentists to become what we call in uh, general dentists, we call them super GPs pretty much. Being super able, GPs. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much being able to do uh, just about a, a, anything and everything and, and having the right amount of discernment to know, okay, uh, I need to refer this out as a specialist. So as a specialist, as a periodontist, what's your training like? What, what is it, what's your training like to become a, a periodontist? Okay. Um, perio is probably one of the most um, evidence-based specialties out there. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. We spend a lot of time uh, in basic science not only in basic science, but in evaluating uh, the current literature as it relates to periodontal disease. Implants uh, have been a part of periodontal therapy since I started um, almost 30 years ago. And so that's a huge component. But at our core, we are periodontal disease managers. And so you're going to get extensive training in the pathogenesis of periodontal disease. And what we have come to understand about the pathogenesis of periodontal disease is that it's inflammatory mediated. And so you've got to have a good understanding of immunology, mm -hmm. cellular biology, microbiology, uh, because historically we put more emphasis on micro. Periodontal disease was caused by bacteria. That is still true. But what we have come to learn in time is that most of the destruction that we see as a result of periodontal disease, attachment loss, soft tissue changes, mm -hmm. and, and bone loss are all mediated by the body's inflammatory response. And so a lot of what we do as periodontists is the understanding of cellular dynamics and immunology. And then an extension of that now is implants. Implant therapy, how does osseo integration work? Again, at the cellular level. So we spend a lot of time in basic science and managing uh, and mastering basic science. And so a lot of our training is spent in that area. And of course, the surgical aspect of it uh, goes hand in hand, but we always link evidence-based um, philosophy with treatment. And I would say as periodontists, I mean, that's what, that's what we're known for. Right. And so you'll find, you'll get the surgical training, but we just don't teach people how to do stuff. We teach them why, what's the science and biology behind what you're doing. Wow. That's, yeah, that's deep. That's deep because uh, I know at, in dental school, you know, we, there's more of a push now, and actually it's a code of requirement or accreditation requirement that schools teach more evidence-based dentistry um, as part of their program. So d being a periodontist or going into that training, you, you're going to get that plus a whole lot more. I know between perio and endo, I think those are the two uh, specialty disciplines that have a lot of EBD or evidence-based dentistry that's part of that of that training. So programs sure. typically for programs in Perio, what are they two, three, four years after dental school? What's the duration typically? They are uh they're three years. They're three years. And actually when I got my certificate in uh, 1988, uh across the board periodontal programs, even if you were gonna uh get a uh, master in science for two years. Uh but with the advent and the emphasis on dental implants, uh, it was felt by our academy that um, we needed an additional year to really include that area and maximize uh, and master uh, implant dentistry. So to answer your question, all perio programs now are three year, three year, three year residency programs. Okay, okay. And you know, you keep mentioning implants. That's something I want us to, to get back on. I had a couple questions cool. uh, about that because like you said, uh, perio, periodontists are placing implants. And of course, a lot of general dentists now are placing implants. Um, 
either with or without a lot of training, maybe not as in depth as maybe a, uh, a periodontal specialist, but also I have some endo, uh, endodontists, root canal specialists that are kind of diving a little bit into the placement of some implants. So, um, I mean, that's a, that's a hot topic right now. And I think as a periodontist, you get, you probably will get a lot more training in that area, especially with implants being such uh, kind of like the status quo um, uh, now than it was as for a general dentist than, than it was maybe 30 years ago. So, um, so it yeah. sounds like you do get a lot of training, a lot more specified training in that area of implants as far as the, the, the actual surgical placement of, of those implants. Um, so we mentioned implants. What, what, what other procedures do you typically perform as a periodontist? Well, at the core of our specialty, as I mentioned, is periodontal disease management, diagnosis and treatment planning. And so we start there first. Periodontal disease uh, is probably one of the most common diseases that we face. I think the CDC probably within the last five years came out with a study that said over 50% of Americans have periodontal disease. And previously, they had kind of lumped in periodontal disease, including gingivitis. But the CDC was talking specifically about bone loss and periodontitis. So over 50% of Americans suffer from periodontal disease. So the periodontal marketplace is, is huge. And that's where our focus as periodontists historically has been, managing typically moderate to advanced periodontal disease, helping people save their teeth, who otherwise would not be able to without some professional intervention. Right. And so that's the crux of what we do. And then probably, again, going back 30 years ago, uh, periodontist incorporated dental implants into our training because teeth are lost, people want to replace them, implants, single best way to replace missing teeth. And so that's also what we do. Within, and I'll go back, within periodontal disease management, you're talking about scaling and root planning or initial therapy. Uh, you're talking about some form of flap surgery that may involve osseous recontouring, uh, bone regeneration around periodontal defects to rebuild uh, bony structure that's been lost as a result of disease. You also have mucogingival defects where you've lost attachment around teeth particularly keratinized attached gingiva. So you're talking about what we call mucogingival surgery, where you're adding tissue to enhance or restore uh, keratinized zones of keratinized tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also extend that into what we call perioplastic surgery, where we're now able to cover exposed or denuded root surfaces with connective tissue grafts. Um, there's functional crown lengthening, where either as a result of decay or fracture, uh, you need to expose more of the anatomic crown or root structure uh, with crown lengthening. So, so those are some traditional basic periodontal procedures. Then when you go into implants, you're talking about implant placement, uh, immediate implant placement, um, alveolar ridge augmentations to be able to expand bone to receive an implant. You're talking about sinus augmentation to be able to treat the posterior maxilla where there's insufficient bone. We can create bone such that we can put implants in. I mean, periodontal uh, specialty includes a lot of advanced surgical procedures and not just the historical, traditional periodontal disease management. But most periodontists, again, practice the full scope of the specialty. That's right. That's right. So with all those different types of procedures um, and your training and, and the full scope of, of, of your practice, what would you say is the, the range or average salary that most periodontists are, are making, given the fact that they're doing, you know, uh, I think more, it seems like more of them are doing implants now. So you have to kind of factor that in because that in itself is a whole you know, a whole different marketplace, uh, but it's part of your specialty. So what's, what's the average 
salary that people could look could be looking at if they were going in to, uh, to dentistry into perio? Sure. When you when you factor in implants, you talk about a, a young resident just getting out of school. I would say that that the that you can expect to make at least 170, 175. Average periodontists are making well over 200, 250 once you get once you get cranking and rolling. And then depending on you know practice size, ownership, equity, those kinds of things. I mean, you're you could expect to earn in excess of 250,000 as a periodontist for sure. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I know that's uh, that's helpful to know for a lot of new dentists, especially those that are coming out of school with high, uh, just a, a lot of investment into their dental education. Uh, but sure, but also, uh, you know that's a that's a good fact to kind of be able to know about uh, work hours. What are your typical work hours? I know yours may be a little bit different uh, in the sense that you're in a, at a teaching institution, but typically nine to five seven to four weekends on call like how does that work that's it you know that's a, that's a, a very interesting question you get asked that all the time uh, um darwin the wonderful thing about our profession irregardless of specialty is that it provides you with a lot of flexibility <laughs> especially when you get into private practice and especially when you own your own practice, you have the flexibility of designing your hours around your lifestyle. And it also varies from area to area. For example, I did most of my training in the metropolitan New York area, New York, New Jersey. There, the work ethic was such that almost every dentist in practice, irregardless of how many years you were practice work Saturday hours. Why? Because people are working. People don't want to take off from work. Everybody's busy in, in Manhattan, northern New Jersey. And so they're off on the weekends. Those are the times that they're doing doctor and dental visits. When I moved south, I moved into Virginia and started practicing after dental school. I found that very few hours offices had Saturday hours. Mm -hmm. Now that I I'm in the, in the deep south down here where the weather is good most of the years, year round. There's almost no dentists open on Saturdays. The <laughs> office hours are Monday to Friday, and they're typically 9 to 5. You know, very few evenings. So people have designed their office hours around lifestyle. And right. so when I was in practice, I typically uh, started around 8, and I finished around 5. For most of the years that I was in practice i had a day off during the week and i i saw patients like four days a week monday tuesday wednesday i was off thursday friday was my big surgery day uh because it gave people the weekend to recuperate and for probably half the time i was in private practice i worked some saturdays depending on uh you know around my schedule i had a saturday maybe a saturday initially i had i worked every saturday and then i cut it back to maybe a sat couple saturdays a month and then ultimately came one saturday a month and then ultimately became no saturday but as my lifestyle changed my office hours changed and i can say this that i was always able i was one of the few dads attending elementary school plays and field trips my kids were my priority. My family was my priority. And I was able to design practice around those priorities. And that's one, that I think is the hidden beauty about our profession is that you have the capability of doing that. Yes, so true. So true. So, been practicing over 30 years now. Um, knowing what you know now and what you've experienced in the different areas of the country that you've worked in, the different uh, types of uh, practices that you've worked in, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently if you had to start all over uh, again? All right, um, several things that I, that that I that I would do differently. First, and and this is something that I tell all of our young graduates. The thing that I have seen in thirty five years in dentistry is that. It's become more competitive. 
there was a time, and some people, you know, say that's not true, but there, is, there was a time when once you got your dental degree, you could pretty much go out anywhere and, and open up an office and be successful. Now, success is not guaranteed. You're going to have to be a little more strategic and a little more intentional. And so I would say look for areas to practice where the competition is not so intense. It'll be easier for you to build the practice uh, and easier for you to sustain one. Uh, typically, what happens is everybody wants to be in the hot spot. You know, <laughs> they want to be in Manhattan. They want to be in the city. And there are places, you know, a little further out that aren't as happening in terms of where people might necessarily want to be, but there's business there. Business. Okay. And so, if yes. And so, when I came out, I went into Washington, D.C. area into a very competitive environment. And so, if I had to do all over again, I would look for an area where I could be busier because there wasn't as much competition. And that's the same, irregardless of your specialty, general dentist, competition for any business, uh, it's, it's an obstacle to overcome. If you're the only game in town, you're going to be successful. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So that, that's the thing that I would change. The other thing that I would change on a personal level is after I became a periodontist, knowing all the things that I know now, what I would do uh, if I were a young periodontist coming out after I uh, accumulate all this skill, is that I would go into practice as a super GP, where I could generate my own referrals, and I could treatment plan, I could selectively refer to other people, I could keep all the perio and all the implants and all those things that I know how to do to myself and do them all as well as other things. Because what I have seen is that in a, in, a, in a practice span of 30 years, we had two major recessions in that 30 year period. And so if you want to recession proof your practice, then diversify your services. And I think any business that a, a, a base would be a base would be a basic truth for any business. If you want to recession proof, diversify your services. And so yeah, when you're just a specialist, you're just limited. When you can do everything, you know, you have that ability to kind of ride through the rough times. And so those would be the two things that I would change. Darwin. Man, I tell you, those, those two are just phenomenal. Um, wow. Wow. So that leads me to my next question about advice. What, what advice do you have in addition to what you just said, but other pieces of advice or tips you have for pre-dental, uh, pre-dental students, actual dental students, new dentists, residents um, that are uh, maybe thinking about this profession. Uh, uh, sure. All along the process, you're in high school thinking about dentistry. You're in college thinking about dentistry. You're in dental school thinking about a specialty. You're in residency, thinking about a job. <laughs> All along the line, the best advice that I could give is investigate and do your due diligence about what it is that you're about to, to go into. When it comes to applying, and, and, and you know this, applying to dental school, very competitive. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a no-brainer to say that first and foremost, you need to concentrate on the main thing, which is your academic performance, okay? You, you've, got to try, you've got to try to excel and be the best and do the best that you can. Not everybody can be a 4.0 student. Right. We know that. But if you're not, okay, still doesn't mean that your dreams are dead. It just means that you're going to have to do some additional work to support your application. That additional work could be work experience, could be uh, work experience in the field of dentistry. It could be something extracurricular like research, uh, working with professors in areas. You want to show people that you're interested. And right. I tell young people this all the time. Irregardless of what it says on paper, your record, 
your resume. What you really want is an interview. And your, rec your resume has to be good enough and have some key triggers in there to get the interview. Right. But once you get the interview, you got to sell yourself. Mm. Regardless of what the paper has says, you, that's your time to sell you. And I have sat with applicants who didn't look so good on paper, but when they sat in that chair and I interviewed them, they were powerful in what they had to say about themselves. Right. That's what gets you into a program. That's what gets you a job. That's what gets you ahead in life. You have to be able to sell yourself. Yeah. Regardless of what advisors tell you that's negative, you always got to stay positive about you. And that has to come across when you're in an interview. Confidence, positivity about you, about yourself. If you have that, you're going to be successful in no matter what you do. Yes. That's... <laughs> I truly believe that. I've seen it over and over. Yes, yes, so much so that, you know, people don't know the steps to, to get to what they're in, to, to attain their goal or attain their, their target, like you said, getting the interview. And then, you know, you have to practice for the interview. You just can't wing it, oh, I'm going to do exactly. that. I'm gonna do. No, it, it requires that you be real intentional on that, on that action so that, again, you've got about seven seconds before that person, that interviewer, uh, makes his or her first impression of you or their opinion of you. You got seven seconds. That's all it takes. So in those seven, 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 that's right. seven seconds to five or ten minutes, if you haven't won them over by then, next. So, uh, next. oh, wow. That's, uh, that's, that's a great pearl right there. Um, wow. So last four questions, and we're going to be wrapping it up now. Last four sure. questions. These are questions we ask everybody on the show. We like to have a little fun and find out more about our, our, our leaders and, and our experts here. So last four questions. Number one, what's your favorite day of the week? I think I know what day it is, okay. but I'm going to ask it anyway. My favorite day of the week, and I was thinking about this, is Sunday. The reason why I say Sunday, it's because Sunday. It's Sunday. Sunday is family time. Sunday, church, family, fellowship. Sunday. 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 There you go. The first day of the week, Sunday. Some people don't realize that, but yes, Sunday. Uh, question number two. What's your favorite food? Favorite food. Oh, all right. That's easy. Lobster. <laughs> lobster and you know what i was uh i didn't grow up in a household where we went out to restaurants and had lobster uh my parents never served lobster any of those things it's a true story i used to cut grass for my neighbors when i was a kid i had a lawnmower i go around that's how i earn money right. one of my neighbors was a chef in a restaurant i used to cut his grass one day he came, I came home, he said, you know, Bill, I want to share something with you. You ever have lobster? I said, no, sir. He said, he gave me two lobster tails. That was it. I took them home to my mom. I don't even think she had ever had lobster. <laughs> I gave one to myself. I let my mom have one. I was hooked from then on. I'm like, sir, every time I cut his grass, I was looking for a lobster. He only <laughs> gave me one, but that was it. That's my favorite food. Oh, man. Okay. That's the story in, it, in itself, I'm sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. What's your favorite procedure, periodontal procedure, or, or something that you do at work? At work. That's easy. I uh, always gravitated towards perioplastic surgery. When I was uh, in full-time practice, what I was known for was root coverage procedures mm. and anything that was periodontal, periodontally related to aesthetics, and that's and that and that's that's still my baby. Gotcha. Okay. And last question of these uh, these four questions is: outside of work, what's your favorite thing to do? Oh, uh, golfing, brother. <laughs> if I'm not if, if I'm not at work, if you want to find me, I'm on the golf course. That's right. 
someday, somehow, <laughs> every day. And that's my goal. I want to play every day at some point in my life. Hey, that's not that's not a bad target right there. So golfing is your your favorite thing. Are you currently working on any any projects either uh, at work at you know with the residents or or any, on your spare time working any on any projects you got going on? This is something that you're going to be interested in. As a director, you know that sometimes you've made decisions about applicants, and when they get there. Uh, you know, they pull a bait and switch on you and you think that, oh my goodness, this is a different person than I interviewed. And so one of the things I'm working on with one of the um, clinical psychiatrists in our hospital is we're going to start to put together some questions that intentionally um, can pull out things like intent, value. What do you value? What are you w willing to work for to honor those values? Those kinds of questions uh, that can help predict behavior. And then we're gonna, we're, we're gonna take like two years and uh, measure outcomes in terms of, okay, these are how these people scored on these questions. How did they actually perform? Mm -hmm. And I wanna use that as a tool to see if I can add some questions that add value to my interview process. Mm. Well, hey man, if you if, if and when you need help with that, uh, I've got uh, some resources that uh, that 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 will be helpful in getting that that okay. data. And so we have all the evidence, and we can move forward with it. So that because that's uh, I think that's something that a lot of people look for, especially those of us that run residency programs. Uh, and being able to have some kind of tool or instrument to help us uh, through that process. So that's a, yes. great pro that's a great project, man. So yeah, count me in on that. Count me in on that. So doc, how, how, right. can people, I will. how can people get in contact with you if they have more questions uh, about, about the profession or um, well, about the specialty uh, and or even about the residency program? How can people, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, Darwin, the best way people can get in contact with me is uh, email. I got, I've had the same email since email was, was, was in existence. <laughs> uh, 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 it's my name, uh, William Riles at msn.com. So that, that, that's, a, that, that's the best way to get a hold of me. I'll, I'll, I'll always respond. That's good. That's good. And we'll include that here on the narrative for the, uh, for the video so people can get in contact with you. Hey, Doc, hey, I appreciate you, man. I, you know, I wasn't sure if you're going to be working today or tomorrow because I knew you were going to be out in the golf course one of those two days, so I didn't know when we were going to get you on. But we did. We got you. All right. It's tomorrow. I'm playing in an Omega event. Mega chat. Mega okay. Okay, well, that's good. Well, hey, we appreciate you. Thanks so much for... Uh, some great advice, some great tips, some great pearls that you've uh, shared with us, not only about the specialty of, of, peri of perio, but also um, things that you would do differently that is universal for our, all dentists and for all people, uh, all professions. So thanks so much, man. And uh, hey, if you guys out there have questions or want to hear more topics, uh, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Riles has shared with us more information about different things that he's discussed, shoot me an email right here at newdentistcoach at gmail.com, newdentistcoach at gmail.com. Until next time, please listen, learn, share, and subscribe. New Dentist Coach, uh, this is Dr. Darwin. Thanks so much, Doc. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Peace. Yeah. <laughs>